Brethren, what can I say apart from a very good morning, a good afternoon and good evening to you all. And thank you so much for joining us here today, especially after last week's debacle. Um, but today's a new day. So as always, I'm going to start with the important housekeeping notes. The meeting is being recorded and will be posted onto our YouTube page. So for those of you who do not wish to be seen, please do feel free to turn your video off now. Um, to avoid any disruptions during the talk, if you could also make sure that your microphones are kept on mute throughout, please. There will be a little bit different today, not a Q&A session so much as to have a discussion. Instead, our speaker, Matthew, would like to uh, have a discussion with everybody after his talk. Um, so if you but we'll do it in the usual manner. If you would like to add to the discussion, please use the hand up icon, which can be found in either the participants tab or the reactions tab on Zoom. Um, raise your hand, wait for your name to be called out, and then you may unmute yourself, um, take part in the discussion, but please don't forget to put yourself on mute afterwards as well. Um, brethren, please do bear in mind, we do like to have these all wrapped up within the hour, um, so just bear in mind that there might be other people that would like to get on as well. Um, as always, we're giving away two of our bespoke Freemasons Without Borders mugs, which you should receive by the year 2022 at this rate. Um, and the question is, says oh, bear with me one moment i'm just waiting for my screen to load brethren how many people in the craft does it take to make a quorum if you can answer in the chat the two quickest answers of course will win um thank you so once again how many does it take for a quorum brethren it is now my pleasure to introduce you to our friend um, Sonic researcher, worshipful brother, Matthew Roger Christmas. Matthew was initiated in February 1989 in Apollo University Lodge number 357, while an undergraduate at the University of Oxford. He was exalted into the Holy Royal Arch in May 1990. Matthew is a member of most orders of Freemasonry in England and in those universal orders which also focus on the temple. He is particularly busy in the mark, the Royal and Select Masters, which is the cryptic rite, as well as the Allied Masonic degrees. Some Christian orders also focus on the temple, and he will cover these also in his presentation. Matthew has written numerous articles for Freemasonry today and the additional degrees, and regularly gives lectures on Zoom and previously in person. His particular area of research is connections in Masonic ritual ideas and symbolism. A former head teacher and history teacher, he now works for a charity as its head of stakeholder engagement. Brethren, without further ado, I will pass the, the virtual mic on to Worshipful Brother Matthew Roger Christmas. Hello, brethren. I'm going to try and share my screen. Let's hope that that works. Um, no, hang on a second. Let's get onto the right bit of the screen. It always works well until you try and do it. New share. Okay, can you can you see my presentation? Yeah, all good, Matthew. Okay, well, for, and first of all, I'd like to say it's really lovely to be back here for uh, for a third presentation. And when I did the first one, we would have I think we were really pleased to have a hundred people listening, and now it's over three hundred, which shows how much this this wonderful forum has grown. And it always takes a lot of preparation to do these talks, but they are definitely worth it because for one's own benefit because you get your own ideas in order. Um, I'm obviously going to talk from the perspective of a Mason from England and Wales, because that's what I am. Uh, but while the organisation of some degrees will be different in other constitutions, the same ideas apply. And um, it's really good to see so many of you here from all over the world and from so many different jurisdictions both in this country uh, and abroad. Now my internet's always a little bit unstable so if I suddenly sound like Davros from a Doctor Who Dalek episode please would somebody let me know and I'll change my microphone. So <clears throat> let's see if it's, it's all working hurrah. So the aims of this presentation well King Solomon's temple is one of the central if not the I suppose the central overriding theme of our Masonic rituals. Yet it's so commonplace that it can be simply overlooked as merely that image in the background, that historical biblical period in which many of our degrees and orders are set. And we all know that Freemasonry is a peculiar system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. But sometimes those symbols become so commonplace 
that we forget their symbols at all, so that we don't penetrate those veiled allegories. We genuinely can't see the wood from the trees, even if it's come from the cedars of Lebanon. This is especially a problem in traditional English male Freemasonry, where we don't really have a tradition of Masonic education, unlike many other jurisdictions, although UGLE's Solomon is slowly starting to change that. And it's often, I think, seen to be a little bit weird, particularly in male English Freemasonry, to talk about the meaning of our masonry, let alone at the festive board. Woe betide the keen mason, did anything approaching an esoteric interest, which you mentioned. We don't really hold with any of that in established Freemasonry, old chap. So don't talk about it here, not really appropriate. The other problem is that the temple is so important and it's so central in many other degrees, not just the craft and the Royal Arch of pure ancient Freemasonry as defined in the English 1813 union of the two Grand Lodges. The chronological gap between the third degree and that of the Holy Royal Arch is over 400 years. So if you don't join other orders which are concerned with the temple, and there are many, then you're missing a great many temple events as well as Masonic symbolism. It's not surprising therefore that many cannot appreciate the importance of chapter when they join it as they've little idea as what has happened since the Master Mason's degree other than that they, they might remember that something has been lost and replaced with certain substituted secrets. Certainly not the temple has been destroyed, the Israelites enslaved, and they've had a long and protracted efforts to try and get their temple rebuilt at all. So this presentation is gonna try and address this in, in two ways. I'm gonna give you, I'm afraid, a little bit of a history lesson, and as, as you expect from a retired history teacher about the, where the temple features in our history and, and also how the orders of Freemasonry interact with that. And I'm also gonna suggest to you just six different ways, just six, they say, oh no, we're gonna be here all night, of approaching the symbol of the temple in our rituals. And there are only, there are many others that you could choose. But at the end, I'd really like to open a discussion among you all, not just have a series of questions to me and then lots more of me giving you my answers. I'm very happy to answer questions, but I'd like to widen our approach. It, this is the idea that you have a lot of inflict learning in teaching to not be the sage on the stage, but rather the guide on the side who's got lots to learn. And I'm certainly not a sage. And I think it'd be really nice to move this platform on, despite the technical issues of people trying to talk and interact, to have more of a discussion afterwards and less of a question and A or interrogation of the speaker. So then first, a little history and suggestion as to where our degrees fit in with that history and with biblical tradition. Some of you will disagree with my dating, but it's very difficult to date these events. And there are also lacunae and source discrepancies. And after all, history is only, as they say, just one bloody thing after another. And as long as you get the order of things and the gaps in between, that's probably all right. So I'd like to start with the building and completion of the Temple of Solomon. Solomon. While all the dates of these events are given, not all of them, of course, happened in reality, of course. Much is just Masonic tradition interacting and interweaving with genuine biblical history. Some of the legends, of course, also appear in more than one surviving degree, even if some of these degrees are today rarely demonstrated, at least in England. So we have, I suppose, the beginning with the fellow craft degree, the second degree, and the Mark Master Mason degree, in which we're involved in building the temple. And then we have three degrees that are all uh, remarkably similar. Uh, they come from the same origins. Uh, my particular favorite, Grand Tiles of Solomon from the Allied Masonic degrees, and that's the, the jewel of that order there. Select Master, another wonderful degree from the Royal and Select Masters, or the Cryptic Rites. And actually the, the Secret Master degree the fourth degree in the ancient accepted right, which in England is only, is only demonstrated. I know it's worked in other jurisdictions. And they're all about guarding the vault and doing work on a secret vault uh, before the temple is completed. Lots of very important masons are involved in that. And then we have in the truly wonderful Royal Master degree, one of the most beautiful pieces of ritual in Freemasonry, in my opinion, uh, we have 
the secrets being deposited in the vault to protect them in case of loss or calamity. Lucky that. And then, of course, we have the master mason, the third degree in which the principal architect of the temple, one of the, the greatest of the builders, is, of course, as we know, murdered. And then we have, uh, a little bit after that, the most excellent master degree, which is the third degree in the cryptic rite, in which King Solomon's temple is finally ready and it's dedicated, as alluded to uh, in the third degree uh, of, the mark, mark, of the mark of Master Mason. And then we get, of course, the calamitous destruction of the temple in our rituals and, of course, in, in Jewish history. But we need to understand the status of Jerusalem and the Jews when this happened. So first of all, you have to appreciate that in about 733, Jerusalem and the Israelites became a vassal of what we call the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The Neo-Assyrian Empire was then replaced in itself by the Neo-Babylonian Empire as dog eats dog. And these are the Chaldeans you will come across in the Bible, the enemies of the Israelites. But it was not until the sixth century that things turned really ugly. And we have two Babylonian sieges of Jerusalem, which are historically happened. And King Nebuchadnezzar II sent his general, Nebuchadnezzar, to crush the Jews. He exiled them and finally, in the second, after the second siege, destroyed the Temple of Solomon. So nearly 400 years after the dedication of King Solomon's temple, we have two degrees. The keeper of the hidden secret in the scarlet cord and what I regard as the most silliest of all named degrees, the super excellent master. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's a super excellent master, which rather gets away from the wonderful degree that it is, the silly name, but that's what our ancestors used to like to call these degrees. And this concerns the reaction of the people to the attack of the Babylonians. The second besieging of the city and its following sacking by Nebuzaradan was a reprisal following the rebellion of the, their tributary king, Zedekiah, the last king of Judah in about 597. And then Gedaliah is made the new governor of the Jews. And super excellent master is set in the temple in Jerusalem and is presided over by Gedaliah as the city is overrun by the Babylonians and the fleeing king Zedekiah is captured by the invaders as he, as he, as he runs from the temple before he's blinded, bound in fetters of brass and taken to Babylon. And in fact, his short-lived successor, Get a Liar, is also then assassinated by members of the royal family, as you'll see in the second book of Kings. Some of the remaining Jews fled, and then General Nebuzaradan carried away the remnants of the Jews into that exile, which we know of as the Babylonian captivity. Sorry, I should have pressed that button earlier, which shows you the jewel of the role and select master degree. And then, 40 or so years later in 539 BC, both Jerusalem and those Jews exiled in Babylon come under the control of the new big bad boy, the Persian Achaemenid Empire, when King Cyrus the Great, in his turn, conquered the Neo-Babylonian Empire and established his Persian throne at Babylon. So we see the destruction of the temple has enormous implications. And then, of course, we move on to a variety of Masonic degrees, which all tell a similar story, tracing the, re the relations of Zerubbabel, a prince of the House of Judah, with first King Cyrus and then King Darius, the two most important historical Achaemenid kings of Babylon. I'm going to explain this section in a bit more detail, because this story is, I think, less well known to Freemasons, even though it's of crucial Masonic significance in terms of the temple. So both the 15th degree of the ancient accepted rite, Knight of the Sword or of the East or of the Eagle, and also the first degree of the threefold chivalric order of Knight Masons with its Babylonian pass, known as Knight of the Sword and originally called the Red Cross of Daniel, although nothing to do with Daniel, are, it's only to do with the prophecy are essentially held in the council chamber in Babylon of the sixth century king of Persia, Cyrus the Great. They trace the next part of our history. And at least the Knight Mason's degrees are now worked in England from Ireland and they're worked in other, in other countries so we can witness this story. The 14th 
intermediate degrees, the 40 intermediate degrees that are intercepted right are only demonstrated with each degree worked once in a 10 year cycle. So what happens? Zerubbabel so petitions Cyrus both to set the Jewish captives free from their captivity, but also to allow them to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. To this, Cyrus agrees, and he also restores the sacred vessels and ornaments of the temple, which had been seized by Nebuzaradan in the first siege of Jerusalem. Cyrus then makes Zerubbabel a knight of the east and appoints him governor of the true Achaemenid province of Yehud Midinata, what we would call Judah. He's able to return to Jerusalem, and there, as we know, the foundations of the second temple are laid. The foundations of this second temple, laid in about 536 BC, are revealed in the excellent master degree, now recently the sixth and most senior degree in the cryptic rite. The passing of the veil, as it's known, is one of the most important rituals in terms of significance in Freemasonry, but was largely written out in England and Wales after the Union. And it's only recently been worked again, having been brought back from Scotland, other than Bristol, of course, where it has always been worked as part of the Holy Royal Arch. And you can see demonstrations of it, and they are truly spectacular. We then have no less than five degrees, which all part tell the next part of the story in a variety of different details, but are all de derived from the same sources. And really, only one of them is regularly worked in this country. These degrees are the 16th degree of the intercepted right, Prince of Jerusalem, the complex 27th appendant degree under the Grand College of Holy Royal Arch Knight Templar Priests, Knight of the Red Cross of Jerusalem, almost never demonstrated. The second and third degrees are the Chivalric Knight Masons, the Jordan Pass, as well as Knight of the East and West, which are at least worked. And of course, the Red Cross of Babylon, one of the five allied Masonic degrees, which a lot of people will, I hope, will have done. And if you haven't, it's about time you join the allied. That's the advert. These later three degrees are there, but they still need putting into context, which is hardly ever done. These degrees are all set less than 20 years later from Zerubbabel's first mission, after the historic agreement signed between Cyrus and Zerubbabel. While some of these degrees end or start in Jerusalem with the Grand Sanhedrin, most of the story takes place in Babylon, where Darius the Great is now king of Persia in Babylon. And this next crucial part of the story is in fact probably best told in the degree Prince of Jerusalem, a pity it's so rarely worked. Tatnai, the governor of the land beyond the Great River, reports that the Jews are rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, as well as the walls to protect Jerusalem. Darius is shown the decree of Cyrus the Great allowing this, and he then receives a rubble, his childhood friend, who has returned from Jerusalem. Zerubbabel reports how the Samaritans had attacked the city and had then sent letters to the local satrap and provincial governor, making false allegations. This governor had then ordered the rebuilding to stop, and said Zerubbabel had come all the way once again to Babylon to request that the building can start. Darius accepts the previous degrees of Cyrus as valid, and reasons that his governor or predecessor, it could be one or the other, had acted under a misapprehension in stopping the building. He decrees that the building shall continue and calls for the most terrible retribution on those who hinder the work. He praises Zerubbabel for his loyalty and friendship since Darius' own youth and honours his position as a prince of the House of David by creating him a prince of Jerusalem and recognising him now as governor of Judah co-equal to all the other prince governors in Darius's many reigns. So the work of the temple can now resume. Chronologically, the next degrees in the sequence of the rebuilding of the temple are that of the Holy Royal Arch, or in ancient accepted right, a very similar degree, the Royal Arch of Enoch, over 400 years after the dedication of the temple as recounted in the degree of most excellent master. But that's not enough. We now have to protect that temple once it's built. Both Nehemiah and, of course, Ezra will be well known to members of the Holy Royal Arch, where scribes Ezra and Nehemiah act, in effect, 
as secretary and, and a sort of inner guard, supposedly being, according to the historical lecture given by Joshua, lectors and expounders of the sacred law and attendants on the Grand Sanhedrin. Now, the Holy Royal Arts, as we know, is all about the rebuilding of the temple, which had been built on the orders of Solomon. There is not surprisingly a complete agreement on the chronology of this period, and there are some difficulties in tying it in with some of the events recorded in the Old Testament. Both Nehemiah and Ezra are historical and biblical figures, but despite what the Royal Arts suggest in the English constitution, they were never in Jerusalem with Zerubbabel at the same time as him. We know that Zerubbabel was permitted by Darius, the fourth king of Babylon, to continue the inter interrupted building of the temple around 520 BC. Yet Ezra does not arrive in Jerusalem earlier than about 458, the seventh year of the reign of the seventh king, Artaxerxes I, nor Nehemiah until circa 444 BC, in the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes. These dates are disputed, but the Bible asserts and modern historians tend to agree that Ezra and Nehemiah were contemporaries of each other, but not of Zerubbabel. Okay, I digress a bit. Now, Nehemiah had served as a cupbearer to the Achaemenid king, Artaxerxes I. He had heard that despite the start of the rebuilding of the temple by Zerubbabel, the people were still persecuted by their enemies and were unable to build the city walls, rebuild them. So he appealed to the king Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes, hearing of his concerns, immediately sent Nehemiah to Jerusalem, as, as told in the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, with a suitable guard and a royal warrant, giving him assistance and full power as governor to rebuild the walls while repelling the growing attacks of those who resented the newly found confidence of the former exile's returned descendants. No one likes the exiles coming back, as we know from our own history. Nehemiah had a faith that knew how to use the tools that God gave him. Among the various actions taken by Nehemiah, he equips the workers on the wall with swords, as well as their building tools. The popular image is that he placed in one hand of the men of Israel a weapon of war, a sword to defend, and in the other hand, a builder's tool, a trowel to build. Now, in fact, trowels are not specifically mentioned in the book of Nehemiah. The use of trowels as opposed to other building builders tools is Masonic artistic license, but it serves the overall point being made and was an image adopted by early Freemasons of Jerusalem rebuilt by Masons armed with swords and trowel to build and defend the temple, the object of all our desires. Well, you can rest now, the history lesson is finished. Let's now look at six possible, and not only, the only ones, different approaches to the temple symbolism. So I'm just going to show you what they are, and then I'm going to talk about them before we have a discussion. These four we've already had a bit of a look at. And these last two we haven't. So there are lots of episodes in our rituals involving Masons building that temple. It's all about that principal task of the Mason. We see that in the fellow craft and the mark degree as they work in the quarries and the clay ground and in the forests of Lebanon. We know in the mark how they mark the stones. We know in the mark that they put the keystone of the, into the sacred arch. We know from select master that they labor in the secret vault. We know in royal master that they craft the holy vessels. And we know in most excellent master, they come together despite the death of the architect to dedicate the temple to God's service. And our rituals are full of references to parts of the temple. So we have the gates or entrances as referred to in both the Mark degree, the gates and the entrances in the master mason degree. The porchway in the middle chamber, of course, so important in the fellow craft degree and central on the tracing board. The sanctuary in the master mason's degree and the holy of holies. And then the royal master, there are the holy vessels are all described to us, such, such as the altar of gold and the table of the showbread. And of course, we have the Ark of the Covenant that is a key feature of royal and select masters and now has become a very important aspect of the newly revived scarlet cord. And of course, not a feature 
of, of the temple itself, but intrinsic to the temple, of course, is the word, later lost, later, best, later lost and then rediscovered. And in the destruction of the temple and the subsequent Babylonian captivity, which is devastating, we have the Masonic triumph of Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel is like, but greater perhaps even than his predecessors, Solomon, Hiram, King of Tyre, Hiram the architect, Adoniram, because Zerubbabel is the one who is so central in the rebuilding of the temple against all the odds. And we see this in the book of the prophet Haggai. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. This is no mere prince of Judah, but it is a divinely inspired man chosen to restore the holy temple against all the odds. He appears in the Holy Royal Arch, if you haven't done the other degrees, with no explanation. Who is he? But perhaps we now know. And then we have the rebuilding of the temple, the discovery of all that was lost. And of course, we know that when it's being built, the keystone is lost and then it's found. We know that King Cyrus had, had the sacred vessels carried off when the temple was destroyed and they are restored. And when the temple is finally rebuilt, that most crucially which has lost, has been lost to Holy Royal Archmasons is rediscovered. And in a Christian interpretation of these universal orders, we have an, a very different interpretation of that which was lost. And perhaps most memorably that is shown in the Night of the Holy Sepulchre and on the Evangelist, a pendant orders of the Red Cross of Constantine, in the Prince Rose Choir degree, the 18th degree of accepted rights, and in the Scottish Master of St. Andrew degree as part of the Chevalier Beneficent Versitissant, CBCS. And then of course, most obviously, which we do do in our rituals, but perhaps not enough because we rarely have, for instance, the first degree tracing board worked and we almost never hear the lectures these days. We have so many physical aspects upon which we can moralize. The working tools, of course, in both the craft and the mark and in other degrees, such as the Royal Art Mariners, although not to do with the temple. 24 inch gauge, probably the most important of those in some ways. And then we have the ornaments, the furniture, and the movable jewels. If you don't know what those ornaments, furniture movable jewels are, then get along to the first degree lectures and read it because it'll explain them in great detail to you. We all learn a lot. I read that up again before the talk and it was you know, very, very interesting to read that again. The immovable jewels in the lodge, that which cannot be taken out of the lodge room, the two ashlers and of course the tracing boards. We focus obviously as masons on architecture and geometry. We can moralize on the keystone and its importance for an arch. We can moralize on the importance of the hidden vaults, the holy vessels within there and in the sanctuary. And of course, on that most important uh, of, of sacred items for the Jews, the Ark of the Covenant. And as we come to an end, I think it's worth looking at this uh, important verse uh, from the New Testament book, second book of the Corinthians. As 20th century Freemasons, we cannot work on the temple ourselves. It's gone. And few of us are builders or architects in real life. But as we're not operative, but rather free and accepted or speculative Masons, we can make ourselves living stones. We can build a temple in our hearts and we can be as a temple to others. In fact, there is a beautiful exchange Early on in the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, one of these two appendant orders, the Red Cross Constantine, of which I am so fond. And I'm just gonna let, let it's gonna play it out to you now on the screen. Now, of course. Bethlehem aside, that being a place of a special importance to Christians in their interpretation of the importance of the temple, of ritual in the temple, this crucial concept of who we are and what do we build and where we build them is central to all Masons of all faiths and binds us together. And of course, it was exactly that house not made with hands 
that is displayed on the tracing board, which we first saw and was probably not explained to us on the first day when we were initiated. It's a great loss, in my opinion, that this tracing board of the first degree is so rarely explained. We need to build this spiritual house in our lives. That's surely the point of Freemasonry. So in concluding, the temple will also mean different things to you, depending on your background, your faith experience and your history. And the question is really, what is it for you? For some Freemasons actually who look to the Kabbalah for their explanation of the temple. It views the design of the Temple of Solomon as representing the metaphysical world and the descending light of the creator through the Sephiroth of the tree of life. And if that interests you, then obviously I would suggest you join Sock Rolls because you would learn a lot uh, from that uh, Christian uh, interpretation of, of Freemasonry in a more esoteric way. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this talk. I haven't bored you to death and you're still here. In fact, yes, it looks like most of you are still Might have lost one person, I think, it's not bad. And I think it helps us understand the ritual context of the temple to able best to consider the various ways in which the temple helps us to make that daily advancement uh, in Masonic knowledge. So be I'm very happy to answer questions now, Amit, but also it'd be really good if we could get a discussion from a variety of people and I can step back a bit. Sure, Matthew, thank you very much again for delivering that talk. Wonderful it was. Um, I'm going to go to, I know we've got a hand up, I'm going to go to Ian Currens, please, Grand Summers. Um, I believe he has a question. Yeah, hello, Matthew. Hi, Ian. Um, the Royal Master degree, where do you think that takes place? Where does it take place? Uh, well, I think in it takes place, as far as I'm aware, uh, in, in the courtyard uh, of the, one of the, of the temple precincts, because obviously what is happening is that, that the, uh, the two people in the crucial exchange are, are looking down. Um, that is what's in, that's what's implied because it's where the architect goes at high 12. Um, okay, so in the court, okay, fine, thank you. Is that a trap? <laughs> no, well, right? I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people believe that it takes place in the Holy of Holies, but that's in contradiction with what we're told in the most excellent master, in that the last thing that happened in the construction of the temple was the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the Holy of Holies, by which time, of course, Hiram Belief was dead. And so, also, of course, he wasn't the high priest, so he would not have gone into the Holy of Holies, no, only the high no. priest, but once a year on the Day of Atonement. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So he can't so be you, in there. Yeah. Uh, so he's you would, walking around the precincts, and similar to where, of course, where his death occurs, at one of those, yeah. one of those gates, I think. I think so. I think okay, so. thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. I thought you were going to throw in a red herring there for Matthew. <laughs> well, it, he he didn't he didn't catch the red hair, and he he just answered the question in a in, in a brilliant way. So I was, I was grateful. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, next, could we go to our very own Murat Gulbakin? Hi, Murat. Hi, Amit. Uh, hi, Matthew. Great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wondered at the end of the talk, you said that if we are interested in the, the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life, we should join something. I didn't quite catch that part. In Masonic, there's a society, a Masonic Society of Free Christian Freemasons, and it's in England. It's called the Society Rosicruciana uh, in Anglia, SRIA, it's known as Sock Ros. It's a Rosicrucian order. It exists in other countries too. Um, they, 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 and there are other orders that look at the Kabbalah, but it's obviously okay. Okay. No, I, not I, just I, the I, Jewish I, Kabbalah, but Christian interpretations yes, of the yes. Kabbalah. I, I am a member of SRI, SRI yeah. yes, in Edinburgh. Don't, so, so you, you I, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, okay, right. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Murat. Uh, next, Othman, come here. Hi, Matthew. Hi. I think the problem we have always, we mix the two, two different temples with the same story, where we will talk about in our ritual about the Temple of Solomon. What we mean is the second temple. The Temple of Solomon was built in the city of David, adjacent to Orshalim. When the other temple was built in Orshalim, which is became Jerusalem. Um, and the story of who built and which one and what we used get all mixed up within our ceremony until we define the difference that the first temple was built as an educational and it wasn't called a temple in other religion called a palace. But King Solomon 
by the river on the slope of the mountain. The other temple was built by uh, the assistant of uh, the Babylonian and the Rubble was built on top of the Orshalim, the highest point, which is the Temple Mount is. And the wall was built around it, which is make it three and a half miles away from the original temple where it was. And that's where the story could get mixed up. We're using people from different times and different temples. I mean, I agree the story is mixed up. I mean, I don't necessarily accept what you're saying. I think there are lots of different scholars who would give different interpretations to both what I've said and what you've said. I think it's not it's not a, a fixed matter what you've said. I think it's a claim and it's a very interesting one. I think, I think though, it's not actually, if I can say so, relevant because it's, it's crucial that the Royal Arch takes the built, that that temple that is rebuilt, which some people call the second temple, uh, although others call another temple, second temple, that temple has to be on the foundations of the first one in order to, for the secrets, whatever those secrets are, to be discovered. And I think, although I've given you this, you know, dull history lesson, it is, of course, a history lesson is, I would never give in a class because it's based on all sorts of invention and people who are, you know, didn't probably, may not have existed with some who did, and also with, with, diff with different ceremonies and, and other bits. So all I was trying to do was give a kind of his pseudo historical, like Masonic, his the Masonic, the place of the Masonic degrees, ceremonies and rituals within that narrative. Hmm. I don't think um, the, what temple it actually might have been archeologically or historically is, is actually Im important. And I think, although, though you may be right, I think talking about that actually is, is confusing because it has to be ritualistically speaking, the same temple, the same, the foundations have to be rebuilt. Otherwise what goes on in the Royal Arch would be meaningless. It would have no meaning. I mean, in it's, terms it's, of, it's an idea. It's the yes. idea that, that follows the, temp, the building. It's not yeah. where the building is situation. Absolutely. Yeah, it's absolutely. the idea that follows the temple. And we know for a fact it could have been built in, uh, in Orshalim because Orshalim was the other bloodline and it was always a war between Judah and Samir. And Orshalim was that time was under Samir and the temple wouldn't build there. He built the temple to, to uh, honor his grandfather, David, and he built it in the city of David. But that's inevitable. The, it's the, what the story tells us more is who, where, and where, and what. That matters the most. Yeah, I get it. It's a bit like I think people who spend their time trying to find if the Noah's Ark's on Mount Ararat. You know, I kind of feel they've massively missed the point. The story. Which is it's, that it's a it's a it's a symbol. You know, it's an allegory, and I don't think we have to have to sort of dig deep into that. But yes, thank you very much. Really interesting point. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, Othman. Um, and just a reminder, brethren, I've seen a couple of messages come up. Um, uh, our speaker today has asked for a discussion rather than a QA, and a um, hence the discussion that's taking place right now. Um, and also, as another reminder, please, please do bear in mind that some brethren are not part of certain orders, so please don't give away anything that shouldn't be heard um, on this platform. Uh, next, could I go to our very own Satyrus? Are you going to try and speak? Let's see. It works. No, we can't hear you. Can't Tyrus. hear Tyrus. Give us a, a thing on the chat. Why don't you put it on the chat? Yeah. And next, we can go. We'll go to Michael. Hi, Michael. Microphones. It's all. All's good. When they are. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. We can. Okay. I'm all in the way in Denmark. <clears throat> Swedish right. Uh, uh, Red Cross of Constantine. Uh, part of a Belgium large too. So uh, I have a, a lot of cross references and I have the appendix degrees in uh, RCC also. So what I see and hear from you, Matthew, and I, I appreciate this because it puts up a lot of the things that are taken in from all the things that came through kings and all kinds of stuff that came into the Swedish rights because that was the kings that made this an elitarian thing in the <laughs> in the northern part of Europe. And, and they took all the best parts and then they burned all the papers and created their own in the Swedish right. But when you speak here, 
a lot of things that I see when I come in our Grand Lodge in Copenhagen, uh, a lot of things that I hear is coming to, into a system that actually are creating a new kind of knowledge. And, and that's really a, a gift in itself, even though I have the second highest degree in the, the Dan uh, Swedish right. Um, but, but this is a truly gift uh, because a lot of the rooms we have, we, we have a, um, a lodge building that are like a Chinese box where you move from one uh, lodge to another, one step in your uh, trip um, uh, through your degrees that changing rooms, dark, bright, under heaven, not under heaven, in a great uh, canopy, under the desert, all kind of, uh, kind of images that are put into uh, to perspective to enlighten you through your path in focusing on the temple. And that's actually one of the things that you put in place right now this evening for me is this about the temple. I know about the temple, I know how, but also the mass uh, interpretation of the temple. So I would like to thank you for that. And then I would like to invite you if you have the time and the, uh, and, and the ability and when we are allowed all this with all the restrictions to, to, to meet in, uh, in Copenhagen to, to, and of course I put this out for, uh, early on also to a lot of other people that actually to meet and then have the, um, the opportunity to meet this because this uh, we have in Copenhagen is, well, it's not unique because it's unique everywhere we move into what we are a part of. Uh, but ours is like, uh, it's like, uh, um, well, it, it sounds uh, a little understated, but it's like an, a, a huge building of fairy tale land to enhance the journey. So, uh, and that is not to reconnect, uh, what are called? Uh, neglect the the uh, how the, the the house is built from a true place of heart to give this journey the best possibility to grow into something massive so so in that putting that in, in perspective and then i i hear you in the interpretation when i met solomon temple i was underneath open uh, what are called the sky first time everything was blue i was standing underneath uh, the heaven uh, or the sky uh, so i looking on the picture be, uh, behind you i would say i was in the first courtyard or that is of course knowing now that is what it is so you are just a trainee so in that way, we are moving through and getting more and more insight. And I, I really like you, your way to move us into this and putting into statements around this. And it's not only appreciate, uh, appreciating you, but also to challenge you. So what are the stars when you are in the Andreas, uh, what are called lodges? What kind of stars is that? Well, first of all, Michael, thank you very much for being so generous. I think one of the massive benefits of, uh, of Zoom is with all these jurisdictions we're getting together. And although mm. I've tried to meet not to give away secrets I shouldn't, despite one or two quotes in the ritual, I've tried not to specify, but rather to accept people think, oh, I, I want to know more, so I will join that. And, but I think those of us who, do, who are in those degrees do appreciate the connections. So I think that's been a really valuable aspect of, of what you're particularly what your uh, that board has done. I suppose for me, I mean, I think the, the, the stars, of course, on the ceiling in some lodge rooms differ, of course, depending on where you are in the world. Um, but for, for me personally, the, the stars in, in that the blue sky that you see, for me, they always represent, you know, not just the, you know, the glory of the Lord or the creation, but also I've got, of course, certain stars are, are symbolically important. I'm not going to go into people will just boo i think we'll about astrology but there are some there are some good books written by masons about not telling you your star sign not giving you your horoscope but talking about the movement of the heavenly bodies and how those 
are again ways and the planets, the ways of symbolizing Masonic ideas of, of light and the journey. So for me, the stars represent the, uh, not just the light of the Lord, but also a journey across the heavens. And that's a very much a sort of symbolical journey, I think. And a lot, of course, of those planets, of course, and other bodies are also used in, in originally when, in alchemy. And I think you can see Freemasonry as a sort of alchemical journey, turning base metal, me, uh, into gold, hopefully a better mason. I think that's that alchemical journey that many of us see. That's a very different image to the temple. But maybe some other people might like to answer uh, Michael's question about stars. It's not a particular area that I'm particularly knowledgeable on. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Matthew, I'm going to go to Sataris's question. Matthew, in some old rituals, if I'm not mistaken, it is reported that the old Masons held their meetings at the porch of King Solomon's temple, not within. This was to remove the religious aspect of Freemasonry, right? Well, I, I've heard that interpretation too. Um, I think, you know, obviously Masons themselves, when they had stonemasons, when they had their meetings, you know, had them in a in a constructed lodge, often at the side of a cathedral or as a church or as a, you know, a building of a building. So they weren't actually inside. So, you know, I think we, again, we confuse the idea when we see people like Hiram, Hiram as a Mason and, and Hiram King of Tyre as a Mason and, and Solomon as a Mason, of course, they, they weren't, they were the rulers and the Masons are the lowly, us. And we probably didn't spend much, we, didn't, we wouldn't have had meetings inside the building. We'd, have, we'd done our work in the building uh, and then we'd have done our work outside. So, but, I'm not particularly sure it's about keeping religion out of it, but but it may well be. I mean, I think again, we have this mixture of stonemason practices from medieval the medieval period, and as they morph into speculative Freemasonry, we're going to us uh, we're going to um, impose our readings and our traditions onto those things, and we'll all see that differently. And I I wouldn't want to give a definitive answer, no, but I think it could well be that. Thanks, Matthew. And uh, we know Satyrus. He will probably email you separately anyway after this, asking more wow. questions. Um, Cyrus is still not working, Satyrus. Um, could we next go to Gordon, please? Hi, Gordon. Well, thank you. Uh, Matthew, uh, like you, I'm a very keen uh, mason in, in a lot of orders and obviously really keen on, on the chapter. Uh, but I do think that people should join the mark before they do go into the chapter because then they would understand it. But what I really want to ask you about is uh, a new issue that uh, follows after the chapter uh, called Pilgrim Preceptors. I've been deeply involved in that all over the country and I want, want to know your views on it. I'm not in Pilgrim Preceptors. I know a bit about it, um, but I don't think I've got a, I mean, I think again, the idea of it is a good one, um, and it's a, it's a relatively old one of the new degrees. It's just obviously yeah. taken off a bit. So I don't know much about it, Gordon, and I'm hoping to join it. So I perhaps need not, to, I don't want to speculate. The more I look at it, I'm trying not to look at degrees I'm not in now. I used to do that when I was a younger mate, so now I'm keeping away from them so that I don't, um, that I don't spoil it myself. I think, I, I think, I would I would slightly say if, if I was to able to rewrite uh, the order of rituals and have them in one body with only one fee, hallelujah, and one set of simple regalia, hallelujah, so not all the expense. I would certainly have I would have the mark before you know the mark master the mark the mace the master mason degree. I right. would have the cryptic right um, yeah. and and the veils back. I would have the allied Masonic degree, Recross of Babylon in there, and, and other degrees like Grand High Priest will probably come in as a sort of installed principles degree. And, and I think therefore, Pilgrim Preceptors might, might also fit in there. Of course, that's impossible because it, we're all the product of history. It's just a shame that time and cost, which is phenomenal, stops yes. most Masons from getting the chance to put, uh, the, put the jigsaw together. But of course, that jigsaw itself was never a simple one picture. It's the product of many, many Masons in the 18th century and the 17th century creating lots of degrees of which many were rubbish and fell away. And the good ones stayed, but so fragmented yeah. that it is a lifetime study to try and see your way through these degrees. Yeah. 
Well, so, if you get the chance to join food and perspective, most of them only make twice a year anyway. And the feed, the feed <laughs> You're the devil, Gordon. <laughs> All these people who come and say to you, it's only twice a year, you know. <laughs> but I'll, I know I see you on the Zoom, so I'll have a chat with you later. The story is fantastic. Thanks, Very Gordon. Good. I'm Very sure good. Matthew Gordon's got that application form ready. I'm sure he has. I'm sure he has. Um, Michael Ramos, welcome, brother. Thank you, brother. Uh, Matthew, a wonderful presentation. So for the sake of conversation, um, I wanted to get your opinion about something. So uh, when we talk about, uh, especially today in your presentation, you know I'm very active in a lot of the progressive orders. We kind of have all these elements to kind of fill in pieces of the story. However, I would pose this to you as um, a discussion point. Do you believe that ultimately the Masonic journey, in a sense, is... Um, if we were to break these pieces out, you have birth or initiation, passing or manship, death or loss, and then some form of a sojourn, some form of that, and then a rediscovery. Would this be to you, regardless of how we place all these pieces, and I don't want to go into specifics, but just this idea of this cycle, is this the ultimate form of Masonic ritualistic philosophy? Can you give it to me again? The four thoughts? Sure. Um, a form of initiation or let's say birth, yeah. passing or manship, life, death or loss, a form of sojourn, and then recovery or rediscovery. Yes, I think I think you certainly, I mean, certainly I can see lots of the degrees fitting into that in, in, in some ways that the, the temple is a bit like that, actually, of course, the temple is, is built and it's dedicated, etc. And it grows and it's destroyed etc so you can see it in that way as well i think the one there's a very important symbolic aspect in some degrees of freemason which is the crossing of the bridge which i'm getting more and more interested in so the idea of bridge crossing and we and there's also and that's in several other degrees i've mentioned but it's also in other degrees i haven't mentioned it's, it, it's like in the royal order of scotland uh, and i think this concept of bridge crossing which is a an idea of moving from life to death I mean, that's a much simpler way of, of explaining it. It simply is a, mo a, mo a moving from one state to another. Often, but what's often different is in the bridge elements, you often get, of course, opposed. There are those who try to stop you doing it. And I think, so I perhaps, so I don't disagree with you, perhaps added to what you're talking about, I think there is also this element of opposition that great, not just are you born, you become a man, an adult, etc. but actually people get in the way all the time of trying to stop. And one of the things that Masons have to do, and, and I think Nehemiah is a great example of that with the sword and the trowel, but also other, you know, in the bridge crossing degrees, you are having to go against those who want to either put you on the wrong path or who actually want to stop you having what they've got. And, and I think that's another aspect of Masonry. There is actually a conflict um, and that's why, of course, we have, you know, I think the black and white pavement is all about that, 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 that there is a conflict there. It's more than just light and dark. I think it's a, an actual duality. So that, that's, but I think you're, you're the, if, we, if, if we look at the way you're doing it, Mike, I think if we, if we all approach Masonic rituals with those kind of ways of trying to, how can I see it differently? How can I suck away from the ritual and the DC telling me quite rightly, I must say it like this and I must move like this. Can I, can I step back from it and see what I'm actually experiencing when I'm both an officer delivering a ceremony and taking somebody through it, but when I'm going through that ceremony, what is happening to me? And, and I think your suggestion and there are others are really great ways to, to see the wood from the trees by stepping right back and getting a sense of perspective. So I think that's a really interesting, and maybe other people might want to talk about other ways they would see it, but thank you, Michael, very much. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, great, Michael. Thanks for joining us as always. Um, brethren, we've got about seven more minutes left. I've got no more hands up. If you would like to um, join the discussion, please let us know and uh, I shall call your name out. Uh, Brian Prince, have you got your hand up, Brian, or is that a clap? You got your hand up? Do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Uh, great talk. Um, do, do we believe when we talk about the two pillars, that on the left and that on the right, do we believe that's from King Solomon's perspective or facing King Solomon? Oh, well, I mean, I'm not, it's a great question, Brian, and one I don't know the answer to. And, and I've, I've read both perspectives. And I think people do get quite concerned about 
it's like when they place the volume of sacred law. Is it for the candidate to read or is it for the master to read and teach from? And, and I think either works. And I think in some ways that the pillars can work either way. And of course, as we know, the passwords were exchanged, weren't they, at one point? So I think it's a bit, if I can say it without sounding rude, I think it's one of those academic rabbit holes that we get, people get very cross in on a, on a Facebook group. <laughs> and I don't know. I think either way works because of course there is no, you know, there is no absolute symbolism. Symbolism has got no right answer. There's not one way. And I think you can look at it in either way. I, I do think that I, I think you can interpret Mace that question very well from the volume of sacred law. Which way should you put it? And either way, and, and you have DCs who will tell you it must be this way. And obviously it must be that way. And they're both right because it's as in most things, there are different reasons why that volume is there. And and I and so and I think the pillars left or right again is is that you know what are they telling us and do we see the right you know as the dexter side and the male and do we see the left as the sinister side and the female and, and is it that and does it actually matter which one is which but the fact that there are there is a right and a left I actually think more important than the two great pillars of the portrait entrance are the three pillars that are the pillars of the columns. Which are uh, you know on the on the um, pedestals of the wardens and the master, and they're rarely ever talked about. You know they're alluded to in the lectures, but actually they're the three orders of architecture, the way they're placed, what they symbolise in terms of the three great attributes that they represent, which we also see in the Royal Art Manor degree. I think they're what I'd like to you know they're all, they're often hidden those three things, and I think I'd like to have talked more about. I haven't mentioned any of the attributes, wisdom, strength, beauty, the Beatitudes, the theological virtues, you know, all those amazing things that we hear and they sort of go in one ear and out the other, but they're all worthy of a really interesting study. There's different ways of interpreting the story. Thank you. Great question. Thanks, Brian. Um, next, could we go to Michelle? Hi, Michelle. You, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um... I found that quite interesting, actually, about the um, which side of the pillar is right and left. And in life, generally, it's, it tends to be as one is looking at the building. Um, and that's how I've seen the two pillars. And would I, by, would I be right in that? I don't think you'd be wrong, Michelle. I think the question is, it's we should make a judgment based on what seems right to us and how it, it tell it teaches us and, and then but not be i think irritated when someone offers an alternative view and i think we increasingly yeah. i think you've seen that on lots of the facebook groups i think i've been on during the first lockdown people got very cross with each other when their jurisdiction didn't thought one thing and another jurisdiction thought another and, and they were all working from the point that we are right and these people are clandestine and these people are true masons and these people aren't and that's the wrong way of looking at it and i think what we have benefited from is that sort of slightly that wind has kind of blown itself out i think now and we are much more talking about how the ritual and how the the, the artifacts and the ornaments I and mean, how they actually how they make us think and that's what i want to do with freemasonry i'm interested in not when people talk about orders of freemasonry i don't get, i'm not interested in the regalia I'm interested in, and that's what you get in the talks. I'm interested in actually what's in yes. that. And, yeah. and I, so I think I agree with you. I think personally, that would be my interpretation. It's probably as you enter, because you're going it's, in. It's that, the yeah, that, that's my point, actually, Matthew, is, is looking at the temple as you're entering it, yeah. ra rather than coming out of it. So, yeah, um, interesting yeah. and fabulous talk. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Great question. Uh, Dudley. Hi Dudley. Hello mate. Um, Matthew, um, the land we now know as Israel, um, if we go back to 3000 BC, um, since then it's changed hands something like 20 times I believe. Um, and as we know history books are written by the victors. So what do we know is fact and what do we know is fiction? Um, because we know what we're taught in school, uh, a lot of it has been debunked in recent years. Um, so I often wonder how much we do believe in the history books. I think with, with respect to the um, the ritual, the stories of the Old Testament, you know, with the Jews and things, which we 
of course, are, are written largely by the Jews. And then, of course, by the Christians interpreting Jewish history and Jewish prophecy as pro prophesying uh, the new covenant. I, I think what we have to do is we have to look at where where stories that we are where, you know, where there, where there is good evidence. And I think I, I've done a lot of battlefield tours uh, for schools in the First World War, and I always I will never give a fact unless I've got three different sets of attribution for it. And I've heard a lot of rubbish talked by battlefield guides and you know it's not true what they've said or they've heard it from their mate and assume it's true. But things like, you know, we do have, for instance, some of the decrees of Cyrus. We do, we do know that. We do have cuneiform tablets uh, from Babylon. Um, and actually, ironically, my son at Oxford has just done his dissertation on a particular cuneiform uh, tablet, which is, has, you know, with other people, they've looked at a whole new, it does give answers to some questions, possible answers to some questions, because it cross references other manuscripts that we have, and other tablets. So I think, you know, we do, we do know a lot about Cyrus, and we know a lot about Darius, because so much was inscribed about them. Um, the actual details of the captivity, and the relationship between, let's say, Nehemiah and Artaxerxes, and let's say Zerubbabel and Darius as chartered friends, is very debatable. Uh, but it's, and again, does it really matter? Because this is not a history lesson I, I, we've been looking at. It's a, it's um, it's where it's where dates and historical happenings morph into rituals written 300, 200 years ago. And, and that's, I think, that's what's important. That, that's why I, I, I don't particularly mind, as often as question about where the temple is. I don't actually care because ritualistically, as long as it, it fits into what we're told in the ritual, that's all I need to know. I don't, I'm, I'm interested in finding out, but it doesn't, it doesn't impact on perhaps my understanding of the ritual. But yeah, never trust a historian. I mean, as you're right, history is written by the winners. And as, uh, as I say, yes, absolutely. The winners are all about the history. Yes. Churchill famously said, history will be kind to me because I'm going to write it. And, uh, and he did, of course. And Churchill also said, give me the statistics and I'll give you the answer you require. Absolutely. 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 Thanks, Dudley. Um, we're going to go to our last uh, question stroke slash opening discussion. And that is with Ewan. Hi, Ewan. Good evening. It's nice to see you. Um, Matthew, um, I think what some people forget is that in the early days of Freemasonry, the rituals were actually passed on verbally from one to the next. And there is actually, well, I'm not sure whether they still do it, but there's a lodge um, just outside Edinburgh which still pass on the ritual in that manner. So the senior warden will tell the next senior warden what the ritual is. And because it was verbal and not written down until probably the 19th century, it changed so that what people in other jurisdictions think is right may just be a different wording which was put in by somebody verbally. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're right. And, and all sorts of straight, we have all kinds of things we don't understand because we don't know the origin. So, I mean, the one that I'm particularly trying to find out the answer is why on earth is this degree called the Red Cross of Babylon? The, the jewel is green, there is no red cross in it. There's, there's a cross possibly in early seals, but and why is it called the Red Cross of Daniel, which is based on a one line in a prophecy when it doesn't even figure in the ritual? But it's because, as you say, people change the names and they and they confuse them. And certainly there's there's no doubt there was a lot of confusion in the naming of the, let's say, the Knight Mason degrees and the 15th, 16th, 17th of the Scottish Rite. And, and, and that caused, because they had the similar names and the similar ideas, so it's, and it changed. And I think, yes, anyone who's looking for a simple solution to a Masonic or any kind of historic question is gonna be, is gonna be, is gonna be frustrated. And I think, I hope what the talk has done is given you some of the things that I think about when I think about the temple. And I'm sure lots of people thought, I wish I'd, I, I hadn't thought of that, I wish I had. Or actually, why has he not mentioned that which I think about? And I, I'd like us to get some, I'd like us to break, particularly in English male Freemasonry, I'd like us to break this kind of, almost this idea that you don't talk about the ritual. Unless you're in a lodge of instruction where you're told what the ritual is, uh, what to do, we don't talk about the meaning. 
because somehow it's a bit embarrassing. It's like, you know, the English don't talk about all sorts of things because we're embarrassed about it. And I think, ironically, Masons are often embarrassed about talking about the ritual meanings. What They're worried they might divide, they, they might be divided from the neighbours, it might be political, it might be religious, but I think you can talk about it in ways that are how we think. And, and, and I, you know, why we've joined in the first place. Because I didn't join to have meals. I didn't join to have regalia. I like both of those things. But I did join because I, I, I really like the ceremonies and, and they, they do a lot for me. And I think there are lots of Masons like that, but actually they keep a bit quiet. That's my hobby horse anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Perhaps we should start these discussions with talking about the weather and uh, we'll go on from there. That's normally a good, good point to start with. Um, Lee, we are finished, but I will come to you very quickly, mate, because I know you've got your hand up. Um, Lilu? Thank you, uh, Amit. Uh, uh, great uh, lecture, um, Matthew. Um, as you were saying, we, 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 we touched upon a number of things about the ritual, about the different orders that's supposed to represent the thing. And the one that comes to mind the most of all for me is chapter. Now, um, and I found in my own experience as uh, being part of chapter and bringing people into chapter, um, how many people did not know what chapter is and that it was the return of the Jews from captivity in Babylonia. And it didn't take them five minutes to build the temple. It took you know, a very, very long time. And, and that is uh, uh, um, some of the stuff. So if we can't understand uh, a certain little situations like that, which is quite straightforward and no one tells them, right? You know, how can we then have another 300 side orders um, that go from all the different kind of things? We don't know if there's any truth in them or, or, or whatever, and whatever they try to imply. In a number of cases, they just bring confusion to people and hence why they leave. Yeah, and I, I think actually one of the great reasons why, you know, the chapter is in trouble in some jurisdictions is because there is this expectation that one has to join it next because of historical reasons from 1813. I think, I, I think other jurisdictions where it's part of a journey and it's, it's towards the end of that journey, I think is better. Um, I, chapter was the first thing I joined and I luck I was in a fantastic chapter and I'm a historian, so I got it. And I'd read, you know, I'd read the stuff, but I think a lot of people don't and they get put off because they kind of feel they have to join it. Yeah. And we can be a bit solemn about it as well. So you're A, very solemn, you're kind of made to join and it's quite long and complicated, and you don't know the story, and you've no idea, Masonically, let alone historically. I think there is the, the new innovation in, in Holy Royal Arch in England, where there is a bit of explanation of what's going on for the candidate, is a really welcome one. But I think if we were to invent m a Masonic progression now, where we could wipe the slate clean, we would, every country of the world, every Masonic jurisdiction, would do it a bit differently, but they would make it more coherent so that yeah. you move from one thing to another a bit more. I don't think you need to be in all the, you know, in, in every other right to understand the temple, but I think something in the middle, more than just the mark, which I think is very important, but I think, I think some understanding, I think the, it, it seems to me the great crying shame is the Zerubbabel legend, which is so important, is in five degrees that probably 95% of English Freemasons never do have let alone heard of. And that's the problem. One of the most, and I think that is a, I think if we'd have kept the veils, I think the veils would really help. If I could do one thing to go, to change things, I would put the veils back into the Holy Royal Arch ceremony. I think that would really help to make it, A, they're spectacular, B, they're easy to understand, they're easy to understand on many, and as many levels, so you've got all kinds of complex symbolism as well as some quite simple symbolism. And it would explain what's gone on as you go right from the tabernacle and, the, uh, and Moses and Aaron and all that, all the way through to the temple. It makes sense of what the Jews were trying to do and why the temple was so important to them and why its destruction was so terrible and therefore why the secrets being rediscovered was such an important job. And they were so pleased, as they say, any job which your excellencies are prepared to give us, we take as a blessing, sort of whatever the words are. So I agree with you, but I think it's a shame. The more we push it, and the more and the less we see it as a real privilege to be in it, once you know a bit, I, I think the more we did that, the better it would be for the chapter, which I also love. 
really not. I think there should be uh, uh, less side orders and more lodge of instructions <laughs> and get togethers like this, like I meet and, 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 and his crew uh, uh, are doing, which is fantastic. And we're all getting to, you know, further our knowledge. And thank you to everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lilo. And I think, um, Matthew, it's, 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 you know, when things are, when times are normal, people don't have the time to do what we've been doing over the last year. And I think it's yeah. given a lot of food for thought. Whereas now we're, we're, you know, everyone's more willing to do a little bit of research to find out more, to ask certain questions, um, which is fabulous, you know, because it's all about a learning. Um, and yeah. each and every one of us will learn in our own way um, and take what we would like to take out of that learning. Um, but, you know, it's been an absolute privilege, Matthew, to have you back on here again. Uh, brethren, for all of you that are still on the call today, Matthew is going to be bringing us a very, very special talk um, for our special edition talks in June. Um, so please do watch out. Last Thursday in June, uh, we'll be hearing from Matthew again. Um, that's only for Master Masons and beyond only. Um, but please do watch out for the circulars on that. Um, just on the question for the uh, the winning of the mugs, the answer was, of course, five makes a quorum. Well done to Gordon Ball and to Bob Ray. If you could send me your details, both of you, we will make sure that you get your mugs next year um, without any problem. Um, and brethren, we're on the last Thursday of this month now, coming up on the 27th of May. So um, please do look out for the circulars that will be sent out via MailChimp. Again, just Master Masons only. We're going to be welcoming Worshipful Brother Tony Harvey um, back to our stage, and he'll be giving us his talk entitled, Is a Belief in a Supreme Being Really Essential? It's going to um, open up a lot, a lot of discussion on that one there, I'm sure. Um, but we look forward to seeing you. For those who can make it on Thursday, We'll, look, we'll, we'll see you on Thursday. And for everybody else, brethren, look, a very good evening, a good night, stay blessed, and we'll hopefully see you next Tuesday. Thank you all. Thank you, Amit. Bye. All right. Thanks, both of you. Thanks, Amit. Thanks, Amit. Good night, Dudley. Thank God you. bless everyone. Good night. Thank good you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Love you all. Good night, Rita. Bye. Hopefully, we'll see you soon. Yes. Good night, Karen. Good night. See you Thursday. Bye. Good night, Jolie. 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 Good night,